Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. If you have ever taken a high school or college literature class, then you probably recognize those words as the opening lines from the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's famous poem, Paul Revere's Ride. Written in 1860, the poem is known for retelling the famous historical event that marked the beginning of the American Revolution. However, by comparing the poem to recorded facts, it becomes evident that Mr. Longfellow's version is very different from the history book and even Mr. Revere himself report happened that night. As a poet, Mr. Wadsworth took advantage of what is called his poetic license. Webster's Dictionary defines poetic license as the liberties taken by an artist or writer in deviating from conventional form or fact to achieve a desired effect. Hello, my name is Caitlin Humphreys, and today we will examine some specific differences between the poem and recorded historical facts that will uncover how Mr. Longfellow used his poetic license to alter who, how, why, and even when this historical event took place. And by doing so, he achieved his desired effect, the creation of an American hero. As the poem and the actual event unfold, a major difference can be seen in the opening stanza where Paul Revere is portrayed as a lone rider. Even though the opening lines, listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, do not specifically say that he rode alone, the implication is there, and is certainly never any mention of the other two men who also rode that night. This fact is supported in a letter written in 1798 addressed to Jeremy Belknap, the corresponding secretary of the Massachusetts Historical Society, where Revere himself reports, after I had been there about a half an hour, Mr. Doss came, we set off to Concord, and were overtaken by young Dr. Prescott. The three men, not one, rode together to Concord. By changing the who, Mr. Longfellow set the stage by giving credit for the success to one man acting alone, a hero. Secondly, the actual purpose and timing of the one if by land and two if by sea signals the how and why is another difference that separates fact from fiction. Again, according to Paul Revere's own personal accounts of the ride, the signals were rearranged two days before by him and a friend and were to be sent to the Sons of Liberty committee members waiting in Charleston to let, them know, to let them know if the British were on the move. Revere states he did, he did this because he was afraid that when the time came he might not be able to get out of Boston and wanted to make sure that the citizens could take the mission if the riders could not get through. However, the second stanza lines, one if by land, two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore shall be, ready to ride and spread the alarm create a picture of Revere standing alone on the shore, waiting to see the signal and begin his ride. Longfellow's recount in the second stanza leads the reader to believe that the signals were for Revere. This deviation from documented fact allows for the reader to become more inspired by the brave bravery and patriotism of a single individual, thus strengthening the creation of a hero. Finally, Longfellow's words, it was, by two, it was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord Town. Leave the reader with a vision of a tired, lone rider who has rode all night to warn the countryside of the British invasion. However, we know that was not the case. History reports that the three riders, Doss, Prescott, and Revere, met up in Lexington around midnight decided to ride on to Concord to warn the Patriots, but were stopped by the British soldiers shortly after leaving Lexington. Prescott and Doss were able to escape, but Revere was captured, questioned, and brought back to Lexington. He never made it to Concord at all. The map on the screen represents the routes taken by the three. The blue line represents Revere, the green represents Doss, and the purple indicates the route Prescott took, the only rider to actually make it to Concord. In his book entitled The Legend of the Horseman, published in 2005, 
author Charles J. Case states, if it were not for Paul Revere's deception of his own famous midnight ride, history might not remember Samuel. So we have examined some major areas where the poem and history do not agree. But why would Henry Wadsworth Longfellow take such poetic liberties to, to alter this historical event? Some say that he may have done so to make for a more exciting tale, but keeping in mind that Mr. Longfellow is a poet, not a historian. And poets often use their craft to motivate action and stir emotion. Therefore, I would like to leave you with these closing thoughts. In 1860, when the poem was written, America was headed into the Civil War, and Longfellow saw that the Americans needed a hero to motivate the people through the hard times ahead. By altering the who, why, how, and even when of this famous ride, by seemingly re to retell an heroic tale from America's past, and by giving a single individual credit for the plan and its successful implementation, he created that hero. Paul Revere.